We're going to be in Acts chapter 16 this morning. We finished up our study last week in the book of Titus. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're just going to be touching on the theme of faith. But before that, let's uh, open up in a word of prayer. This morning, uh, we're going to pray for First Baptist Church in welcome. And uh, Pastor Chris Griggs, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for uh, another Lord's Day where you've given us the privilege and we live in a country where we have the freedom to meet together, to sing, to study your word, to worship. Father, I pray for our sister church, First Baptist of Welcome, and Pastor Griggs this morning, Lord, that you would bless their service as they sing, as they preach your word. Lord God, I thank you that we live in an area where there are many strong Bible-preaching churches. Father, as we take a look this morning at Paul and Silas and their faith here in Acts chapter 15, I pray that you would, would open our eyes to our own condition. Lord God, I pray that you would reveal to us if our faith is a feigned faith, a facade. And I pray, dear God, that you would give us a heart and an understanding to have genuine faith. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a minute, we're going to read Acts 16, verse 25 through 32. Before that, I want to set the context. In Acts chapter 16, we find the, the narrative of Paul and Silas going to the city of Philippi. Their custom was to go into the streets and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. One day, Paul and Silas were out preaching the gospel in the streets when a young girl who was a fortune teller, who was also demon-possessed, started following them and causing a commotion. After several days of this, this, uh, this young lady causing a commotion and a scene, Paul recognized what was going on, and he cast the demon out of this girl. This young lady had actually been a slave of a group of men who were exploiting her and earning a living off of her fortune-telling. And when they realized that they would no longer be able to exploit her for their own profit, they accused Paul and Silas to the authorities. They accused them of causing trouble and basically being troublemakers. The local authorities were called in. Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown into prison. Once in prison, their feet were locked into the stocks. We're going to pick up in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. You know, faith, and we don't actually see the word faith in this passage, but faith is one of the most important words in Scripture. Some synonyms of faith are the words belief, the word trust, the word defendant, uh, dependence, the word confidence. The best definition of the word faith is found in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence or the conviction of things not seen. True faith, and I say true faith, or the title of our message this morning is Genuine Faith. Genuine faith must impact the way you live. As our regular attenders used to uh, know, uh, still know, we used to live in South America in the Andes Mountains. My son and I, one of our hobbies that we did together was mountain climb. 
And uh, we, mounted, we climbed several peaks over 15,000, went over 16,000. But when you mountain climb in the Andes Mountains, you will often walk on trails that take you along ridges and cliffs and drop-offs of thousands of feet. One of the most important things in mountain climbing is a belief in gravity. Now think about that. A belief in gravity. If you didn't believe in gravity, you wouldn't make it very long as a mountain climber. Believing in gravity changes the way you walk along the edge uh, uh, on a ridge or the edge of a cliff. It changes the way you view gorges and drop-offs and rocks. Faith in God and in the Bible is no different. This morning we're going to see four different but important thoughts about genuine faith in the life of Paul and Silas. And um, so that's our topic this morning. It's going to be our topic over the next several weeks. Number one, genuine faith. And we're talking about genuine faith. And I, what I want us to do this morning is evaluate our faith because probably not a person here this morning would say, I don't have faith or I don't have any faith or I don't believe anything. You wouldn't be here if that were the case. But I want us to evaluate the condition of our faith. Do I have genuine faith? Number one, genuine faith is greater than our circumstances. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, let's think about the circumstances that Paul and Silas were in at that moment. After preaching the gospel and doing what they believed God had called them to do, and casting this demon out of this young lady, they were attacked by a mob. Verse 22 that we didn't read, but we're going to read right now. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Verse 23, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. Verse 24 adds to this that their feet were placed in stocks. So Paul and Silas had been beaten mercilessly for helping someone. They, in that moment and in those moments, they had lost their freedom. Now just think about that for a moment. If you've never lost your freedom, I've never been arrested. <laughs> I've never lost my freedom. But imagine that you have completely lost your freedom for doing something that you believe God had called you to do. Everything going on around Paul and Silas was outside of their control. They had no control over anything. They were locked up in a nasty, smelly dungeon. There were no human rights. There were no human rights activists to, for them to call on and, and get help. They had no idea what was going to happen the next day, yet we see that their faith in God was bigger than their circumstances. They were in prison singing hymns and praises to God and then praying out loud. Their faith was genuine. They did not allow their circumstances to cause them to lose faith. In fact, their circumstances proved what kind of faith they actually had. The genuineness of our faith is proven by the difficulties in life. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you rejoice... Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, notice those words, a faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of J Jesus Christ. Our trials, our difficulties, our heartbreaks test the genuineness of our faith. In the parable of the sower, most of you remember that, one of the, some of the seeds fell on the rocky ground. Jesus said in his parable that those seeds germinated quickly on that rocky soil. They grew quickly. But when the sun came out and it was hot, the plants withered because there, was no, uh, there were no roots to sustain the plants. 
Jesus then went on to explain that this is a metaphor for a person who receives the Word of God, has apparent faith, but then when trials and difficulties come, they fall away from the faith because their faith was not genuine. See, our trials and difficulties test our faith. And when our trials and difficulties test our faith, they may shake our faith. Our circumstances may cause us to question and to even doubt. I've heard it said that we shouldn't question God. I beg to differ. We can question God. Read the Psalms. Read the way David spoke to the Lord in the book of Psalms. He took his frustrations out on the Lord. He took his doubts to the Lord. God's big enough to handle our doubts and our frustrations. Our circumstances may cause us to question and even doubt. This is part of God's work in us to produce growth in our faith. But in the end, real, genuine faith is greater than our circumstances. If my circumstances cause me to lose faith, not now I'm making a difference between shaken faith and struggling through doubts, but if my circumstances cause me to lose my faith, it's because I never had a genuine faith to begin with. Genuine faith is greater than our circumstances. Number two, genuine faith is attractive. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now look at this last phrase, and the prisoners were listening to them. Think about this. These prisoners... I'm sure in most prison settings, and I'm not familiar with our local jails, but what I learned in, in South America, there's a, 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 a grapevine and a gossip that runs through places like that. These prisoners here knew what had happened to Paul and Silas, no doubt in my mind. They knew what Paul and Silas were in prison for. They knew that Paul and Silas had been beaten. They obviously knew the conditions inside of that dungeon. So when Paul and Silas were singing and praising God, the verse says they were listening to them. They were not just hearing, right? Have you ever, your wife has ever told you something, men? Because usually it's the guys that are guilty of this. Your wife tells you something and you hear them. And then an hour or so later, you say something, and they realize that you were not listening to what they told you. You said, honey, I told you an hour ago. And, you realize, and, and she said, you weren't listening to me. And I was like, yeah, I heard you, but I wasn't listening. Well, these prisoners were listening, all right? And here's why they were listening to Paul and Silas. They knew that Paul and Silas really believed what they were preaching, now, it's midnight. They had been beaten. What would you do if you were in jail at midnight? I think you would be trying to sleep so you could escape that circumstance at least for a little bit. But these prisoners knew that Paul and Silas had a genuine, authentic faith. They saw Paul and Silas. They saw that they were willing to suffer for their faith. And yet, at the end of that suffering, they were still willing to pray to God and to praise God and to publicly um, be a testimony of that faith. They knew that what Paul and Silas had was real. See, genuine, authentic faith is attractive. It's attractive to people who don't have it. The reason most people don't respect Christians is that many times our faith is not genuine. I really believe that. And, and I know that outwardly someone might mock Christianity, but inwardly, when they see genuine, real, authentic faith, they're attracted to it. In fact, what's the number one complaint that the unsaved would have about Christians? Well, they're just hypocrites, right? We've heard that. Well, the reason they say that is they've seen enough Christians without genuine faith that that's what they think we all are. Many Christians are really just religious. Now, I'm talking to us. We have religious practices. We use religious language. But we don't have a genuine faith in God. And we don't have a genuine relationship or walk with God. 
And so when the world looks on, they hear our words and they see our lifestyle. They hear our religious rhetoric, and then they see how we really live and treat people on Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. And unsaved people see through that religious facade because unsaved people are not attracted to religious people, but I promise you they're attracted to genuine faith. Paul and Silas had that. They're in that prison. Those prisoners were listening. They were attracted to Paul and Silas' message because they knew Paul and Silas were the real deal. You know, and I'm just going to add this, the reason many children reject the belief of their parents is because they see mom and dad at church, and then they see mom and dad at home, and the two things don't, don't jive, and the kids say, I'm not interested in having what my parents have because it's not a genuine faith. Parents are religious, they go to church, but I'm telling you, what our kids need and what this world needs more than anything is genuine, authentic faith. Not put on, we're not pretending to be perfect, we're real people who still sin, who still struggle, who still have issues, but that genuine faith in God and that belief in God will be attractive to the world. The prisoners listened to Paul and Silas because they were attracted to their genuine faith. Number three, genuine faith is compassionate. Verse 26, 27, and 28. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. So here we have Paul and Silas again, praying and singing praises at midnight in that prison. God evidently sends an earthquake. This earthquake caused the prison doors to open. They caused the chains and the bonds that were holding these prisoners in to be unfastened. It was dark. And in this instance, the prisoners had an opportunity to escape. This prison guard knew this. In that day, if a prison guard allowed prisoners to escape, the punishment was execution. So in that moment, when that prison guard thought these guys are going to escape, he figured it was better to take his own life than to suffer at the hands of the Roman authorities. When Paul realized what was going on, Paul stopped him. Don't harm yourself. Stop. We're all here. Now, I want you to stop for a minute right there and put yourself in Paul's shoes. Okay? All of us in Paul's place. You've been beaten, thrown into prison, locked in stocks for doing something good and positive. Prison guards in that day were known for their inhumanity. Human life did not matter. And in fact, many prison guards in that day took pleasure in human suffering. So when Paul recognized that this prison guard was about to take his life, it would have been easy for Paul to think, go ahead, buddy. What comes around goes around. But that was not Paul's reaction. Paul stopped him. Don't do that. Don't harm yourself. See, Paul's genuine faith produced compassion in his heart for the prison guard. This is because Paul knew that his faith in Jesus was a faith that was powerful enough to turn a life around. Now, here's the interesting thought. Remember Paul's background. Many years before this, Paul had been responsible for persecuting Christians. Paul had been responsible for throwing men and women into jail for their faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul had overseen the execution of Stephen. Paul knew the power of the gospel to change lives. He knew what the gospel had done in his life. He had been full of hate and rage for Christians and wanted to destroy them. Then he knew, met Jesus through the gospel, and all of a sudden he was one of those Christians that he had hated and raged against. And that genuine faith in Paul produced compassion 
for this prison guard because Paul had experienced the faith and his desire was for this prison guard to experience the same miracle that Paul had experienced because genuine faith produces compassion. When we have experienced personally the gospel message of Jesus Christ and we know what he did for us, we know how our sins were forgiven. We know who we were before and who God made us to be after. When that happens in our life and it's genuine, we will desire for other people to experience the same thing. Genuine faith is greater than our circumstances. Genuine faith is attractive. Genuine faith is compassionate. And finally, number three, genuine faith is fruitful. Verse 29, And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. So in this moment, this jailer, he had seen Paul and Silas' genuine faith in the face of suffering. He knew what they had gone through. And in spite of their difficult circumstances, they were still singing praises to God. This jailer, seeing that they had compassion instead of a desire for revenge, that produced conviction in the heart of the jailer. That jailer wanted what they had. Their faith moved him. That jailer recognized something real and something that he needed. See, their faith produced fruit in his life. God used the gospel message lived out in Paul and Silas to cause that jailer to recognize his need and to desire what they had. He had evidently heard the gospel message because he knew the right question to ask. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He asked. See, he had seen genuine faith in Paul and Silas and it produced fruit in his life. So I want to ask you the question as we wrap this up. Is your faith genuine? I've been asking myself this all week long, thinking through scenarios that could happen to me that could try my faith and cause me to lose faith. I'm not asking you this morning if you've ever prayed the sinner's prayer. I'm not asking you if you've ever asked Jesus into your heart. I'm asking you, do you have genuine faith? Is your faith real? I'm not asking you about your religious practices. I'm asking you, do you have a genuine faith? Is your faith greater than your circumstances? Again, there are circumstances that many of you have been through. This dear uh, young man who, who passed away yesterday left a wife and two children. I can't imagine what they're going through. Uh, so I hope that that's not making light of those difficult circumstances that shake our faith to the core, because they do. But is my faith at the end of the day greater than my circumstances? Is your faith attractive? In other words, does that Christian life that you live, is it the sort of thing that attracts your children and attracts your neighbors? Or is it that religious facade that pushes people away? Does your faith produce compassion in your life for the lost? Does it produce compassion even for those people who maybe have mistreated you or that under normal circumstances you just wouldn't like? because of the way they are. And finally, is your faith producing fruit in your life and in the lives of others? These are, these are important questions to ask ourselves and to evaluate ourselves. If your answer to these questions is no, or I don't know, or maybe I don't care, I want to challenge you, evaluate your faith. Ask God to show you. I want to finish with these two verses. Verse 30 and 31, Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the most important question in the world. Paul's answer and Silas, and they said, Believe 
in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You, and if your household believes, they will be saved. I love his answer. It's simple. If we're not careful, we make the gospel message complicated. All Paul said was believe in Jesus Christ. Rest in him. Have faith in him. Depend on him. Believe with all of your heart that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Believe that. Jesus actually told a parable about faith that's the size of a grain of mustard seed being large enough to move a mountain. So faith in Jesus Christ to save you, the size of a grain of mustard seed, if it's enough to move a mountain, I imagine it's enough to save you. Lord, you remember the father whose son was demon-possessed and they tried everything and they couldn't heal his son? And that father came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You can say that. Jesus, I want to believe in you, but I have a lot of doubts. Please help me believe. Have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior?